Have you ever heard the saying? Have you ever heard the saying? If you're not growing, you're dying. Or if something is not growing, it's dying. It's very common. If you Google it, you'll find it attributed to many different people. And I don't know if we can say it's absolutely true in all cases, but a lot of cases it is. If you have a garden or have some house plants, I think you realize this is the case. If it's not growing, it's probably dying. They have tried to develop some plants where that's not so much the case. They've tried to develop uh, grass, for example, that doesn't need to be mowed. Uh, wouldn't that be nice? But it's supposed to grow up about this tall and then just stay there. But does that happen? It still has to be mowed, at least occasionally, even the best examples of this. Or bushes that grow up so far. I just want this bush to be two feet tall, and that's it. Uh, you still probably have to trim it a little bit. It's just true that if it's not growing, it's dying. Um, if you have a plant, a house plant, and it's not producing any new leaves, what's your conclusion? I think it's probably dying. That's just the, the way it is. That happens in our life. We want to be continue to grow, to continue to move ahead. Stopping that is, is like dying. I have retired from full-time work, and yet I still want to learn new things. Learn this, you know, this text that we're preaching on today. I've studied it again to find out new things that I didn't see before. Keep going ahead, learning. Otherwise, it's like lying down and dying. I, before I came here, I served in a congregation for 10 years that was mostly people who were older than I am. Wow. <laughs> Average age was 80-something. A number of these people were you know, in nursing homes or they just in bed even and couldn't do anything and they were ready to give up. There's nothing. I just well die. There's nothing to, to live for. And yet, even in those cases, if these people were active, believing Christians, that can show in their lives, even in those years. And people around can take note and use these people as an example of how to face old age, how to face dying, to be calm in the face of death. Doing that is a blessing for people. And learning more about that and more about our confidence even when you're older, can be a service to other people around. And, of course, then praying for other people. I <clears throat> want to keep going ahead. I used to encourage some of these people, you know, be prepared to die, but plan to live. We have to be ready to die. God can call us home anytime, as we have found out this past week. But let's not plan that. Let's make plans. Let's do things. Let's find out things. Let's grow so we can keep serving the Lord as long as he, lives, he lets us live on this earth until he will come and call us to himself at the right time. And hopefully we have unrealized plans when that happens, but that's the way it is. And that really brings us to <coughs> uh, <coughs> you know, one of the most important aspect to grow in is to grow in our faith to continue to, to learn new things, to continue to get stronger in our faith, be able to resist the temptations that, that are around us. And in a lot way, this is done best with people around us. Living life together is the best place to grow in faith. Uh, <clears throat> in his letters, Paul often talks about growing. Continue to grow. Desire the milk, the, the sincere word of God. Grow in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be better ready to, to meet the demands of this world. We're going to look at a section that Paul wrote to Timothy, his second letter to Timothy, perhaps his last letter as he was in prison, where he actually doesn't use the word grow, but he's encouraging us to, to do the same thing anyway. He, he tells us this. <coughs> As for you, continue in the things you have learned and about which you have become convinced. Continue to in the things you have learned. This is really about growing. Keeping in those things. Now, 
It takes effort. Is it worth it? There are things in this world that are worth a lot of effort, even to the point of standing up for your things until you die. Perhaps uh, it's a political position you have, a political uh, candidate that you really want to promote because you feel you convinced this person is going to be good for this country, good for this state, or, or, or whatever. So you work hard uh, for this position or for this candidate. Perhaps you are convinced that socialism is always evil and wasteful and should never be implemented, so you work hard to prevent that. Or maybe you're convinced that the government should be setting up more programs to help poor people who, who can't help themselves, even if it drives the country into steeper and steeper debt. I'm just proposing a couple of strong uh, statements, but there are people that are convinced of these things. And maybe you are. That this is what is guest for this country. Uh, <clears throat> perhaps you have a family member who's being unjustly accused or attacked. And you stand up for them in the face of a lot of ridicule or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> perhaps you live in a country where a neighboring superpower is attacking your borders and trying to annex you or annex pieces of your country. And you stand up for that. You're willing to go to war, to fight, to serve to the death, to stand up for the rights of your country. You know, these are all things that are, that are worthy of that. But Paul here is talking about something that's even more important than any of these things we've talked about here. Your eternal welfare. Is that worth standing up for and fighting for and growing for, even to the point of death? You have learned, you have been convinced that you have a Lord and Savior uh, that has saved you from all eternity. He has washed you clean of your sins, made you holy, so that you are worthy to stand in His sight and live forever in His kingdom. Is that something worth standing up for and working for? Because you, your conscience also tells you the other side. If you don't believe this, you will spend eternity suffering the consequences of your sin. Wow. That's pretty strong stuff. And that's what Paul is talking about when he wants us to continue um, in what we've learned. In fact, it's, you know, this is the most important thing we can stand up for, especially when we realize that the world is against us. The world is ridiculing us for doing what we're doing, for believing what we're believing, and that can affect us. The devil is trying to pull us away, to snatch us away from our faith. And we even have a sinful nature inside each one of us that is also fighting against this, that doesn't want to put in the work, doesn't want to grow, wants to stay the way we are and eventually lose grip on that faith. So we need encouragement to continue in the things you have learn. Now, one of the things that Paul encourages us to do as we're uh, wanting to do this continuing in what we've learned is just to look at him. Now, I may seem conceited at first, but let's look at what he tells us about that. Uh, <clears throat> he says, continue in the things you have learned, you have known, uh, you know from whom you have learned them. You have faithfully followed my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfast endurance, my persecutions, my sufferings, the kind that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the kind of persecutions I endured, and the Lord rescued me from them all. Indeed, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil men, evil people, and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You have seen this. He says, look at me, but he'll look at other people too. Timothy's mother and grandmother had taught him the true faith, long before Paul met him. The true faith as it was practiced by believing Jews, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that God had given them this, this true faith. And then when Paul came to town, he was able to tell Timothy, as well as his mother and grandmother, that, you know, that Messiah, 
you trust, pay it, you put your trust in, that was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. He's the one that came to this earth and, and carried out those promises that were made about the Messiah. Uh, you believed all these promises, these prophecies? This is the one who it was. Um, and they put their faith in him, so Timothy was able to look at them, to look at Paul, and to see their effects, their teaching, their faith, their demeanor, their perseverance. Uh, now, we should take note that just because some dear person taught you something doesn't necessarily mean you, you have to believe it, that it's going to be true. Paul himself is an example of that. He grew up in a family that apparently, you know, valued him so much that they were willing to spend large amounts of money to educate him. They sent him to the best school, to the best teacher. Gamaliel was the best Jewish teacher uh, in the world at that time, it seems. All the way to Jerusalem, which was a long trip, so that he could get this good education in the Pharisaic way of life, the main Jewish teaching of the day, which taught that you have to work, do good works, to earn God's favor, earn your right to live in his presence. This is really a perversion of the true Jewish faith that, that Timothy had learned. And it was wrong. Then Jesus came to Paul and called him and rebuked him for persecuting his church. He had to throw this all off. We have to be discerning in what we believe and what we put our faith in. Still, if you have, if you had or have loving parents who brought you up in the faith in Jesus Christ, taught you and made sure that you learned about Jesus and that he is your Savior, this is something important, something to value, something to look to them as your example. Um, it's a great thing to, to cherish that. Now, in the case of Timothy, he had come to know Paul very well. Because on the first missionary journey, uh, he learned from Paul about Jesus. And on the second missionary journey, when Paul came back there just a few years later, he invited Timothy to come along with him. On his, and from then on, he followed Paul many places, not everywhere, because sometimes Paul would send Timothy out on special assignments. And he was able to witness Paul's faith, his perseverance, his teaching. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, Paul, he says, you, you witnessed my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfast endurance. Now, many of these things are things you can't see. But, Timothy was able to witness the evidence of his faith, of his love, in the life of Paul as he carried out his work and, and dealt with people around him. And that helped Timothy, gave him confidence. He could see what this is all about. Um, but he also witnessed, he says, you witnessed my persecutions and my sufferings, and the Lord rescued me from all of them. Now this is particularly interesting when you consider that uh, in the city of Lystra, and that's a city that, that Timothy was from, for preaching the gospel, Paul was stoned. They thought he was dead, and they walked back into the city. Uh, he was able to get up and go back into the city himself and left shortly thereafter. But he was stoned to the point where they thought he was dead. And he still says, and the Lord rescued me from all of these things. That is uh, quite a faith. In fact, as Paul is writing this very letter, perhaps his last letter, he's writing it from a prison, from a dungeon, chained, facing almost certain death, execution for his faith. That's the situation that Paul was in, most likely, when he wrote this letter. In fact, uh, according to secular history, he probably did die. He probably was executed shortly thereafter. And Paul would believe, yeah, this is another way that the Lord will rescue me from the hands of evil people and save me. And Timothy witnessed all this in Paul's life, and it was a definitely an encouragement to him. Uh, 
So the truth is that those from whom we learn provide an example for us. And we can turn to them and look up to them and, and grow by knowing them. Now, what's in this for us? You know, as we live together in Christ, as a congregation, uh, for example, we can follow what Paul suggests too. Uh, many of us have or had loving parents who saw to it that we were brought up in the faith. Now, we want to look to them and see their example and let that example be uh, for us to, to strengthen us and, and to help us. Um, then there are the pastors and the Christian teachers around us who, who were able to guide us and teach us in, in different ways. Turn to them. Look to their example. Use that as, as a, an impetus for your own faith and life. Uh, thinking about these things can help us to grow. We can look around us. You are in a congregation of fellow believers who believe the same thing that you do. Uh, now, we have a special situation here in that all of us who have become believers have learned the basics of the Christian faith in the same way, the, what the Bible teaches. We are united in that. You can look around and anybody around you and, yeah, they believe basically the same thing as you do and you can look to them for an example of faith. Maybe a faith that, that you are weak in and they are stronger in. And that can be an encouragement to you. Uh, and you can take that one more step. Now we gather as a congregation. We can even gather for some cookies and coffee a little bit later, have a little fellowship. But there's another way which is, again, opening up, is the life groups. Gathering in smaller groups, more intimate groups, where we can more, be more interactive. Sermons are not very interactive, are they? Uh, but when we gather in small groups, then we can ask each other questions and discuss things uh, more closely. Uh, <clears throat> which group should you join? Well, don't worry too much about it, because they're all filled with people that have share your faith. Uh, <clears throat> Find, I would say, find one close to you, geographically close to you, and use that because well, then it would be easier to get to, uh, fewer excuses for not getting to it, and if they find out people that are living close to you, they can be a help and, and encouraging you and reminding you, maybe when you forget or, uh, I don't feel like doing it, maybe they can be a help to that, but that can be a very much of a, of a help to us in growing in our faith together. And looking at the other way, you might be an example of faith for people around you. You've grown in faith in ways that they haven't, and maybe you don't realize it, but you can be an example for them too. And they can look to you to grow in their faith. And we do that for each other. Especially, you know, as we grow in our faith, and our faith starts to show more, it can go both ways. So, what now? Look for examples of faith around you to follow. Now, encouraging Timothy to continue what he had learned, he points out something else. He says, Continue in the things you have learned. You know from whom you've learned them, and that from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So he said, Timothy started learning about, about the Lord at a very early age, from infancy. Of course, that was long before Paul even knew him. He had learned uh, from his mother and grandmother. His father was a, was called him a Greek, which probably implied he was not a believer himself. But his mother and, and grandmother were. And they started at an early age to teach him about God. Now, they could not just pick up a Bible. There were not, I mean, a few bucks you can have a printed Bible. Almost everybody can have one. If you can't afford to buy one, somebody at some church will give you one. It's very easy. Or go on your phone. UVerse or uh, Bible.is or uh, <clears throat> one I use is Olive Branch. A number of programs where you can get the Bible free. They didn't have that. The only Bibles were 
very meticulously hand copied versions written on on uh, leather scrolls which would end up being quite expensive individuals didn't own them typically they were in the synagogues so like Timothy's mother and grandmother they would go to the synagogue they would listen when the word was read they would commit sections of it to memory and be strengthened that way then they would take it home they could recite sections like Psalms for for Timothy they could tell him the stories of how God had saved his people in fact that's very much like parents do today very much like what happens over in precious lambs where our teachers are instructing small children about Jesus so they can learn to have faith as Paul as, as, as Timothy from infancy you have known these things uh, now of course uh, what they had as, as scripture at the time was the Old Testament what we call the Old Testament. The New Testament was this starting to be written. The Old Testament was written over a period of about a thousand years from 1400 to 400 B.C. telling about the promises of Jesus, the promises of the Messiah to come, who would come and save them from their sins, and many pictures of how that would work. Sacrifices, for example. I call those the gospel and pictures. It showed that sin is serious, requires sacrifice, the sacrifice of blood, but God gives forgiveness through that sacrifice. Um, and uh, Timothy learned the, these teachings and, and learned to know the Messiah. He came to the knowledge of the Messiah, and that led him to faith, which saved him, which gave him forgiveness, which gave him life. Now, it was only after Paul came that he would learn that this Messiah's name became was Jesus later on, but he knew him before he even had that name. And then he goes on, he says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, well-equipped for every good work. So Paul explains here, these Scriptures are inspired. That is, breathe, that's inspiration. Uh, like respiration. God breathed. Inspired by God. God, in some way we don't really understand, breathed into his chosen writers what he wanted written down in this word. So it becomes God's own words in the style of the many writers that he chose. And this is what gives scriptures uh, that now includes, of course, the New Testament such power, such universal relevancy, such uh, importance, such usefulness for everyone who is willing to, to listen to them. Um, so now we can use these words of God as an absolutely truthful and useful guide to faith and life. They can be used to teach us about God and His way of salvation. They can be used to rebuke us when we stray from God's will, which is what is best for us. To give us a guidance, uh, to, to correct us when we go wrong, to, to change our life uh, in a better direction. To train us in a life of righteousness. All these things are in that word and useful for that. In short, these, these words of God can be used to help us grow in our faith and to make us well equipped for every good work now it's possible in our day and age you can take a Bible either printed one or on the, and read it learn from it benefit from it grow your faith from it but you know it's normally true not true that you can teach yourself it's normally not true that you can rebuke yourself. When's the last time you rebuked yourself? Sometimes it happens, but usually not. What, uh, how about uh, correcting yourself or even training yourself? These are things that are best done when we live life together, when we come together uh, as we grow in our faith. So the truth is, you know, God's Word provides holy words for us to grow together. 
So what's in it for us now? If you want to become a good salesman, what do you do? Maybe you get a book. Maybe you get several books. You read them to learn what's the best way to sell something. Or you get a teacher or someone that's been good at it. And they will show you one way to do it. And maybe it'll work for you. Maybe it won't. Because there's no absolute way of, of being a salesman. And you may still fail at it. Uh, <clears throat> but if you want to learn more about God, more about the God you believe in, you're going to need His Word. You want to learn more about how to serve Him? You're going to need His Word. You want to learn more about how to correct your life and learn where you've been sinning against Him so you can correct your life? You'll need His Word. And that's why our whole purpose as a church is gather around the Word. We gather for worship. We hear sections from God's Word. We hear sections from God's Word expounded and explained and applied for us. We, our whole worship is based on God's Word. Uh, <clears throat> and we live life together as we, as we grow in that Word. Every Sunday morning. But there's even more opportunity, as we've talked about, the life groups, which are just starting again. A chance to, to, to grow together in faith in a smaller, more intimate, more interactive way. Gathering in the homes. All but one of the groups, I believe, will be in, will be a, a in-person meeting in, the, in someone's home, scattered all over throughout the, the, uh, the triangle. Um, I guess they've been pretty well distributed where, where those meetings are going to be. Uh, and we can gather and we can discuss and we can learn, dig in deeper into that word and, and not just dig in deeper, in it, but discuss how it can apply to our lives in a way that we can't do in, in a regular worship service. So, what can we do? What now? We can gather to meditate on God's word to grow in our faith in different ways, in worship, life groups. Uh, <clears throat> in our country, we have a very special freedom and opportunity to gather as Christians and worship him and hear his word. We don't have to worry that somebody's going to come crashing through those doors and stop our worship or arrest any of us. We don't have to worry that somebody, people are going to gather around our church and start throwing rocks at our roof or at our windows. We don't have to worry that somebody's going to come in the middle of the night and burn down our church. Yeah, I suppose it could happen, but it's pretty rare. Our Christian brothers and sisters in other parts of the world have experienced these very things. In our, in our churches. We have a special opportunity. Let's take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, and we can gather in our homes without interference too. Gather as fellow Christians to just dig into God's word. Uh, we, so we will want to live life together as Christians as we grow in our faith. May God bless our gathering and our growing. Amen.